Hello everyone and welcome to my first video with the Making History DLC in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.1. This install is stock except for environmental visual enhancements, which adds to clouds, and one modification that I'll introduce later on. This was recorded during a live stream where my goal was to build all the replica rockets now possible with the Making History DLC, and to do so simply and quickly, I wanted to get them all done during the live stream, so uh, so that I can move on to more creative things, if you will. So, they are not going to be very detailed, but I wanted them to perform correctly. And so we're starting off with Vostok. And here you can see I decided to use the LV-909 as the second stage engine on the Vostok rocket. And you can see little spider engines as the verniers. I did turn off the gimbling on the LV-909 for realism. And uh, here we have a new part, a uh, decoupler that is actually supposed to be for hot staging. It seems to have a limit of about 50 kilonewtons thrust before it explodes, so you might want to throttle down when you're trying to do the hot staging if you want to use that. Uh, so maybe a little bit more than 50 uh, kilonewtons. Uh, here, I was unable to find a way to make the proper taper for an R7 rocket on the center stage, but this is as close as we could get. Uh, we do have these new shrouds on these new engines, uh, engines uh, that look like the RD-107 or 108 that are used on the R7 type rockets. And we have these new vernier engines which are really overpowered, they have 40 kilonewtons of thrust and I constantly have to uh, thrust limit them to make sure that they're not like the main engines. I mean they provide a significant amount of thrust. So uh, here we have new booster parts with the DLC. And uh, these triangular fins, I think, are also part of the DLC rather than 1.4.1. And so I'm using them as the fins. They can be painted different textures. You can see a texture selector at the bottom there for many of the parts. And here I'm thrust limiting the engines because they really do provide too much power. So here we go, applying it out. Ignition and launch. And that's about a healthy thrust to weight ratio for an R7 style rocket, so I was satisfied with that. We had thrust limited the main engines to about 56%, I think, and the verniers to something like 25%. So, quite a lot of thrust limiting. And the boosters are performing well until decoupling. And they have built in separatrons, those booster tanks. So, they automatically separate as you would expect with an R7 type rocket. And the fairing separation shows us the Vostok module and its service module. So here the first stage is completing most of the way to orbit, but our second stage finishes it off. We still have too much delta V on this rocket, but that's alright. We could have gone with a smaller second stage here. But I guess uh, for this test a little bit of buffer was healthy. And here we ended up with a lopsided orbit because there was too much power. I think actually on this occasion I had greater thrust on the main engines. And now I'm going to tune it down to 56%. You can also see me underfueling all the stages because we had just too much delta V. So I'm trying to get this to feel right and see what that entails. I think uh, judging from when I built the Soyuz, the tanks when you fill them fully and when you uh, use close to the full thrust, well actually about two-thirds of the full thrust of the engines, you get a more Soyuz rocket rather than a Vostok rocket. Vostok is a much smaller payload than a full so Soyuz spacecraft. So here we go again, trying it out, and this time when I made orbit it was a uh, nicer, more... well I had to pitch down a lot to manage the orbit. There, there was a lot of weird maneuvering going on to make sure that our orbit ended up to be somewhat circular. But it did end up somewhat circular, and I was able to decouple. And uh, there we go. There is the spacecraft. Now let's bring it down. I've got a little ant engine on the tail, and that's really sufficient for what the Vostok service module is supposed to do, which is just deorbit it. On the way down, uh, I was trying to hit land, and it's actually a lot harder, and I'll discuss the new launch facility in a sec. Uh, but uh, here, Jeb is coming down into what looks like a volcano to me. I'm sorry it's in the dark, but that's how it ended up with uh, with everything. It was a pretty steep re-entry and he survived. I decided that as in Vostok he should EVA and use his new parachute. And I think that just comes stock without the DLC now, the EVA parachute. 
and there's severe, well, significant glidability with this parachute. It's uh, quite, uh, quite a glider. So here we're gliding into the volcano. Well, I mean, it looks like it has a nice green patch of ground. It's a, it's a um, extinct volcano, a dormant volcano. I'm not sure. But uh, we have Jeb go into it, and I tried to set him down safely, but we ended up uh, face planting anyway. So, yes, after that, I moved on to Soyuz, which is a little bit more complicated. It has three modules. Uh, it has the orbital module on top, the descent module in the center, which I'm trying to recreate using one of these new structural parts. And I'm also adding little separatrons for the, the little uh, explosives or cushioning boosters, if you will, that Soyuz has on touching down on the ground. And here, the service module. I opted for a monopropellant service module because I thought it was a little bit uh, closer to the truth. And in order to get appropriate monopropellant engines, oh, there's an engine plate, that's a new part as well. Unfortunately, without tweak scaling, the solar panels are a little bit big, but we'll have to make do with that. And so, uh, using monopropellant, we needed a monopropellant service module engine, and for that, I just decided to use two puff engines and just tweak them into the center. So. You'll see me put them off to the side here, rotate them appropriately, trying to get this right, and then overlap them, and then thrust them at them each 50%. Now we're carrying extra mass like that, but I decided for aesthetic reasons it was preferable. So here we go, move them in. And if you don't know the hotkeys for the gizmos, um, one is just the regular selection tool, two is for um, translation, 3 is for rotation, and 4 is to select the parent part, uh, which I won't get into, but here we go, the, the translation, and second stage I decided to keep the LV-909, but add the new vernier thrusters, which we also saw on the first stage, And uh, but we'll have to thrust them at them, of course, because they're really overpowered. And in fact, the uh, LV-909 only has 60 kN of thrust, each of these verniers has 40, so that's obviously too much. So I was trying to figure out exactly how much it ought to be given our mass and I decided that 50% was fine for this stage. And now we can fuel everything up to the top and the thrust limit on the base engines I decided would be good to set at about 67% or two-thirds. So there's still a little bit OP for an orbital rocket like this. They could do much more if you really put it to full thrust and add more fuel. At this point, I'd like to discuss the new launch site, which you can select by hovering over the launch button in the VAB. And people have noted that it is certainly lacking in facilities, which is sad. I was a little bit more concerned by the fact that there's just not a lot of land around. If this was supposed to be a duplicate of Baikonur in Kazakhstan, A, it shouldn't have the mountains. B, it's really, really close to the coast, and it's surrounded by water on all sides, except for north. So, uh, that was my attempt at hot staging, but now we have a lot more thrust on this stage, so it didn't go very well. Uh, actually, we didn't really hot stage, I let the first stage go out already, and anyway, uh, I have to practice my hot staging in stock, which is not something I'm used to doing in stock. But yeah, the location of the launch site was a little bit puzzling to me. Why they picked that place instead of a little bit further to the east where there's a huge swath of land that looks a lot like Kazakhstan, I don't know, really. So, oh, we did lose the solar panels on fairing separation on this, so that was not good. We'll have to fix, uh, add a little bit of extra diameter to the fairings to make sure they don't do that. And here we are, I accidentally waited too long to separate our modules, we were already in the atmosphere, I separated off the orbital module, sorry it's nighttime, but I think we ultimately land in daylight. Now when I separate off the orbital module, I had that piece left behind and I didn't know what decoupler would get that off. So of course I was a little bit panicked by the fact that uh, we still had our modules inside the atmosphere when we weren't supposed to. So I decided to just not try and fix that right now and make sure our capsule was oriented properly. During the descent, I noticed that we weren't getting the full flame effects and I had to turn the aerodynamic effects back up to normal. I had them on low, I had copied my previous settings file from another install and I guess I had them on low for some reason. 
Probably because of lag and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, the module came back down safely. We tried the retro thrusters, and they didn't do very much. But successful splashdown, and three crew members brought back, so we could move on to Mercury Redstone. Now, we don't really have a launch escape system for the Mercury size capsule, you know, the Mark 1 capsule that we've always had. Uh, so I had to build a makeshift one. It doesn't look very good, but I accepted that. And I added the fins for the redstone rocket. Remember, the redstone rocket is only supposed to go suborbital, so it's just getting Jeb to space and splash down into the water near the launch site, and that's all we need to do. I decided to stay at the current launch site. It's not that hard to switch between them, but I, I basically just forgot to switch between them. Anyway, off we go. We do need to go a little bit to the east. It's not like going to orbit where you have to flatten out or anything, but we don't want to land on the mountains, for instance, or uh, land on the ground, which is not what Mercury is supposed to do. So you can see where we're at there. And yeah, it's just, it's just not where I would have expected them to place this particular launch site. I noted that with the mountains, it sort of reminded me of the Chinese launch site where they keep landing stages on villages. But anyway, uh, despite my best efforts to aim for water, we ended up coming back down on land anyway. Uh, so, so much for that idea. Also, I didn't have the retro package on this version of Mercury. So when I build Mercury Atlas next, I start off by adding the retro package. But anyway, Jeb came back safely and there wasn't too much of a fuss. And so now on to the Atlas rocket, which brought the Mercury spacecraft to orbit. And well, the Atlas rocket didn't get too much love from the Making History DLC. It's definitely the hardest one to build. It looks off center, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, but yeah, uh, the tanks, actually these tanks look fine. And again, we get a whole new set of 1.875 meter tanks, which I've been using through, uh, with the Vostok and Soyuz rockets. So we've been using that size, and yeah, well, I had to use engine nacelles to try and make the, the Muchkat, the booster fairing, if you will. The engine, we have a new engine thrust plate, and that has an interesting decoupling feature that I decided would work for separating off the boosters. And, well, it separated off the boosters but with a little bit of a bang, so not really cleanly this time. Maybe a little bit of tweaking would allow us to get it off cleanly. At least, uh, with this configuration, it didn't take out the, the center engine on the Atlas rocket. And altogether, it's working quite nice with the little spider engines as our vernier thrusters, but the trajectory wasn't quite right. You can see it's lopsided and we ran out of fuel. Also, I failed to dump the liquid fuel in the engine nacelles. So this time, uh, you can see we have a little bit less liquid fuel, that's because the engine nacelles don't have the liquid fuel in them. And here we have the separation of the booster ring, which is yeah, still exploded. And there, a much better orbit, though still we have to shut down and coast to apoapsis before burning for orbit. And so now, now we are in orbit after that burn. And retro burn, these little Sceptrons for retro burn were a little bit too powerful. You can see a rather steep trajectory, but still one that Jeb could survive. But we weren't able to separate off the retro package. Uh, it got caught on us. And that's sort of like what happened with John Glenn, though not quite. Especially since the retro package didn't blow up during re-entry like it did with John... Well, it ripped off during uh, John Glenn's mission. But it did get stuck. On ours, uh, it didn't really completely get destroyed even on smacking into the ground. So, yeah. Rather resilient retro package, that. On trying to build Gemini Titan, I had a little bit of a problem with the service module. And clearly the service module, they didn't really have the capsule shaped right. They made the capsule go from 0.625 meters to 1.875 meters. And then there wasn't really any space for the service module section. Uh, if it was me, I would have probably made the capsule go from 0.625 to 1.25. I know that's a duplicate of the Mark 1 command pod, but it'd have two people in. And that's sort of what they did with the Vostok and Voskhod modules. It's the same capsule shape, they just added an extra person. But the IVA view would be different and the texture on the outside would be different. And then you'd have space for the service module. I couldn't use the 2.5 meter parts underneath, 
Uh, of course, with that little cone for the service module you saw, it went to 2.5 meters. Couldn't do that because the tanks would be too heavy for the engines, which are clearly made for the Titan rocket. So I had to stick to 1.875 meters to use the engines that are obviously meant for the Titan rocket. And that meant using a straight service module rather than a conical one. But here we are making orbits. It, it all works. Uh, even though I have this service module angst, you have to use a cylindrical service module instead of a conical one. But that's alright, we can deal with that. And everything else works, except you'll note that the hot staging for the Titan rocket was not great, and I have to work on that still. So off goes the service module in the dark, and that means we're re-entering in daylight. You can see the interesting taper on the Gemini capsule here. And I'll let you decide what you think about that. But here it goes. Um, on splashing down, somebody asked to see the IVA view. And it is a decently good IVA view, so let's take a look at that. That's what it looks like inside. Cozy. Very, very Gemini. So, yeah. We have that IVA. The IVA is... I, I think we checked all of them, but I'm not sure. Now, there's supposed to be this little service module to contain the parachutes and all for the Apollo module, that's also added. Uh, but it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't quite fit right. And I decided to just put the parachutes there, especially since I wanted to use the stock launch escape system. And the service module would di didn't really fit with that either, so I decided to just give that all a miss. Here you can see me adding the service module, a new part, and also the AJ-10 service module engine. And I modified that, so I told you there is one additional mod to this, and by default, the service module engine that comes with Making History has a 375 kilonewton thrust and a 412 second ISP. That compared to the real AJ-10 on that stage, which has about 90 kilonewtons of thrust, 92, 96, I forget exactly, and it's about 314 seconds ISP, maybe 311, something like that. Uh, so, I felt it was completely unbalanced. Uh, in fact, it had more thrust than the J2 analog here, so I decided to nerf it. I wrote a... Uh, the module manager has been updated, so I wrote a single module manager patch, and when I loaded, it said one patch loaded for the first time ever. Just one patch. Um, I made the AJ-10 have a 90 kilonewton thrust, and I gave it... I made it consume monopropellant, which I felt was a little... I actually had a poll on my stream, and I felt that that was probably more appropriate. And I also gave it an ISP of 260 instead to balance it with the rest of the engines. It seemed a little bit better in relation to the AJ, uh, in relation to the J2, like that. Now here we are building the Saturn 1B. I'm gonna save the Saturn 5 for a completely different video because that's a completely different subject, and we have to go to the moon and do all that sort of thing. So I'll save that for a different video. But here I'm using those engine new engine plates to create the little fairings around the Juno and Redstone tanks that make up the Saturn 1B's distinct uh, look. I decided that I had built it a little bit too tall, it was rather heavy. Uh, it's important when you're building the Saturn 1B to realize that its structure was ridiculously heavy, and also it had to underfuel the service module on the Apollo in order to launch successfully. Oh, and you do need to run fuel lines to those engine plates if you put the engines on in a particular way, so make sure that you've got fuel lines going if if you've got the engines on in a particular way. On the opposite side, if you got the fuel on the opposite side of the plate, I guess? I don't know how it works. Anyway, somehow I managed to have the fuel not feeding. So here I am, uh, rebalancing. I needed more fuel. Uh, we had launched and it turned out it wasn't very well balanced, so I needed more fuel on the first stage and less fuel up top. And here we go. One reason that we have to underfuel tanks in relation to the real rockets, let's say. I mean, there's a lot of reasons because KSB is not quite the same. But one major reason is that this stage, the J2 stage, in real life is a hydrolock stage. And hydrogen isn't very dense. So the tank looks big. And so you have to, well, if you want to get the look right, you have to get a big tank. But there's actually not that much fuel in because hydrogen isn't very dense. So that's why we have to underfuel the tanks like that. Okay, and so here we are. Uh, oh, and on the real rocket, 
uh, you basically do have to keep a uh, high angle of attack with respect to the prograde vector. Uh, you can't just go straight prograde and expect to make orbit. It's just not like that. It, it's a uh, sort of weird rocket. The, both the Saturn 1B and Saturn 5 require a high angle of attack during the second stage. Not during the third stage on Saturn 5, that's pretty flat. So here we are, I used the service module to complete orbit, still need to sort of optimize the trajectory a little bit. But there we are, I decided not to bring it back down because I was going to do the Saturn V after this, which again I'll reserve for a subsequent video. So for now, with these replicas, and I, I'll answer any questions you have about them, I'll say thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did enjoy this video please do press like, and I'll see you next time.